Okay. Now, hopefully, we're actually good. Alright. <clears throat> Can you hear me? Yes? Good. You're conscious. We're conscious. I've heard urban legends about synthesis going wrong, one half-person getting lost. Do you remember our name? Uh, I have done this opening part recently because uh, I had to make sure that... Um, I had to go through, like, three or four GLOX interpreters before I found one that would actually work on my computer with this specific game. So, I do remember our name, but I'm going to pretend we don't because it's funnier. So, let's say our name is... Joseph Joestar. Er, no. We're Alexandra now. Before the synthesis, I was Alex. You were... Okay, so if the other person was Alex, then I guess I was Andra. Yes! Okay. We're both here. Neither of us lost our minds in the synthesis process. As far as I can tell, the operation was a success. We're meant to be one person now, unrecognizable to anyone who knew us before. And this is how we get a diegetic explanation for the second person narration. We love it when that happens. Like in... Harrow the Ninth. Alright. So. Here, we've got our nice little map. Counterfeit Monkey. A removal by Emily Short. Release 11. Serial number 230220, Inform 7 build 6M62, I6, er, I6 version 6.41, library 6 slash 12N. I guess I wasn't supposed to really read that whole bunch of numbers, but anyway. Let's try to get a look around. I haven't been able to run our body without your help, but maybe now you're awake, it'll work better. To get a look around, type look and press return. If you do not want help getting started, type tutorial off. Back alley. This isn't much, is it? Just the back sides of a couple of buildings, some peeling yellow paint, and... Not even much by way of windows to look in through. I think the place where we had the procedure done is just a block or two away, but I've already lost the door. I imagine they change it. This alley runs north to the open street, towards the town square. That's the way you'll want to go first. You can find out more if you... Look at the yellow buildings, or shorten it to L, yellow buildings. The buildings are no doubt due for renovation, but haven't received it yet. There are no windows facing this way. You have a fleeting thought of how we got here. Memories will list your currently active memories. There are other things around here that you can look at, too, if you like. You can check out other things in your surroundings, or look at me to see yourself. If I do the look at me, we're going to get just a 
tiny bit of a um, tiny bit of a dysphoria thing from Alex because Andra's body is the one that um, turned out more dominant in the mix. Anyway, uh, look at me. This body is more you than me. Well, it would be since we came out a girl. Still, I feel a bit odd inspecting us too closely. It feels like invading your privacy. Feel free to look around some more. Look around. Okay, that's still there. Oh, windows. No windows facing this way. Um, let's go memories. Currently on your mind is how we got here. Remember any memory to review it. Uh, hang on. Looks like the... Oh, I think I know what my problem is. I didn't disable my... Um, I have a um, plug-in on Firefox to disable auto-playing media, and I forgot to turn it off for... Um, I forgot to turn it off for Overclocked Remix. There. Now hopefully it'll play songs one after another. Currently on your mind is how we got here. So let's type, remember how we got here. Cluttered industrial room. The synthesizer was right at the center of the room and we were inside it. An unshaven man in a blue jumper was prodding us with his foot. Wake up, wake up. But we couldn't move even though you were half conscious. So he panicked. We'd paid him to let us recover in comfort, but he wasn't about to risk having a corpse on his hands, even an unidentified one. He picked us up and dumped our body in the back alley and left. Then we're back in the present. So I guess that's about all we can do there. Let's head north into the town square. Sigil Street. The buildings here are two and three stories, with shops at ground level and elderly apartments above. The shops are closed for the holiday. A typographer's office, tourist boutiques of colorful skirts and ethnic bodices, rarely if ever worn by natives, and t-shirts covered with font designs. Passing by the reflective window, we catch sight of our single blended body and it creeps me out. A narrow alley runs between buildings to the south, while the street continues east. Now we're in a new area. There are new things to see. Try look at the shops, or L, shops. We peruse the offerings. Colorful skirts, font t-shirts, ethnic bodices, and a morning dress. I gather from your thoughts that you actually like some of the skirts, but I'd prefer that we skip the cross-dressing for now. Our synthesized body may be female, but I'm still getting used to that. Sometimes the things we examine have parts that we also might want to look at. That morning dress, for example. Alright. 
L. Morning dress. A black vintage gown trimmed with much lace and dripping with jet beads. There's more you can do than just looking around. To check what you're holding at the moment, try typing inventory or I for short. You insisted that we bring almost nothing into the synthesis room, so the criminal who was performing the synthesis couldn't rob us. I had hoped there were there was more honor among thieves, but you said no, there isn't. We are equipped with your R remover, an essential we mustn't part with. That looks interesting. Try looking at that R remover. It is a blunt-nosed plastic device about the size of a laser pointer that can be waved at things to remove excess R's. It is not very powerful and often fails against large items. On the other hand, it has a wide range of action. It can be set to any letter we choose. These are, if not exactly cheap, hardly unknown in Atlantis. It can be set to any letter we choose, hmm? That sounds like a hint. Try set the R remover to you. You flick our thumb over the small knob. We now have a U remover. The letter remover is going to be very important as we try to escape here. To test it out, try wave U remover at morning dress. Now let's see what happened as a result. There is a pink cloud and the morning dress, O-U-R, turns into a morning dress, O-R. An outfit of striped trousers and fancy coat, such as men sometimes wear to fancy weddings in the morning. Aw, I wanna wear one of those. Your score has gone up by one point. Something we just did just raised our score. We must be on the right track. To find out what exactly we did right, type SCORE. You have earned one point for using the letter remover. You have not yet removed most of the rest of the alphabet from anything. You can spend more time looking around or checking out your inventory to see what you've changed in this location. When you're ready to move on, you can head east. Okay, so I've got my U remover. Uh, let's do look around. About L apartments. From down here, we can only see the shuttered windows and occasional balcony or awning but you can guess what they're probably like from the environment. Old-fashioned inside, kitchens and bathrooms awkwardly fitted into niches and closets of buildings that weren't designed for plumbing. But they're also probably rather cozy and handsome, with exposed beams under the ceiling. How about L typographer's office? The office advertises custom fonts and symbols, though it is very unlikely that anyone decides to have a custom font made simply because they happen to catch a notice in a shop window. In honor of the holiday, there is also a display poster showing the form of the humble comma as it manifests itself in a variety of popular fonts. What else can we look at? Uh... Let's just go east. Ampersand Bend. A bend in the street which runs west and north. Oh, let's read the um, hint text upstairs. 
Unless you're playing this game in text-only mode, you should see a little blue and white compass on the side of the screen. That compass will always show you which directions you can go next. Directions in blue lead to areas you haven't visited before. Directions in white lead to places you've already been. So here we've got this, and we've got... It shows us that west we've been to, and north we haven't. And it shows us that Ampersand Bend leads into the park. Alright, Ampersand Bend. A bend in the street which runs west and north. This district combines the old and the new. A small museum in an ancient stone building to the east. A shiny real estate office south. The window of the museum is currently displaying one of its exhibits, a codex. A temporary barrier blocks this empty street from the busy fair to the north, though there is a door that could be opened with the correct code. From here, the gaiety and excitement of the holiday are fairly loud. Let's... Navigating with the compass directions works, but you can also type go to to travel to a named place. Go back to alley, or go to back alley will take us back where we started, for instance. And that is really handy. Okay, so let's say look at museum. One of several small museums around the older part of the island celebrating the discovery of Atlantean language tools and the development of its modern society. This particular museum is housed in a stone building. Parts of the old medieval city wall are still visible in the foundations. All that can be seen of the exhibits is the external display window. On the other side of the protective tinted glass is a codex. So let's look at the codex. A manuscript of Atlantean origin from the 16th century. It records a series of slightly mad visions of what the world would be like if the composition of letters could be systematically exchanged. At that time, the name-driven nature of the universe was not yet understood, but some consciousness of it wiggled towards the surface like a breaking tooth. The lunatics were the first to notice. I've visited this museum before and seen the inside, by the way. Many of the pages are filled with what we would now consider elementary rebus puzzles. Alright, let's look around again. Look at the real estate office. Advertisements in the window describe the offerings around town from a studio apartment, looks like a fixer-upper, in Deep Street for $823,000, to a house near the university for $2.5 million. Prices for villas in the northwestern part of town are all listed as available on inquiry. I can tell you find all that shockingly overpriced, but trust me, land is scarce on this island, and there are a lot of people who want to own it, not just locals, but international corporations. All right. Let's see if we can try going to the fair in the north. The temporary barrier is locked. We'd need to set the code lock to the right number. Oh, that's a hint. Let's go back to looking at the museum. And I want to set my... Let's see, it's currently a U remover, so set U remover to X. We now have an X remover. 
Now let's wave that X remover at the codex. There is a distinct spearmint flavor, and the codex turns into a code. A bit of paper on which is written 305. So now we can try to go north again. We set the wheels of the code lock to 305. Click! The barrier door unlocks. We open the temporary barrier. I'm glad to see you're feeling ready to face the wider world. Here's what we think we need to do. Get my backpack from the cinema, retrieve your remaining possessions from the locker at the hostel, and meet my colleague Slango at the Counterfeit Monkey. So today is Serial Comma Day, one of the biggest holidays on the island, and a time when half the police force is off duty, while the other half... is overextended. The perfect day to make an escape. The square at the center of town is therefore crowded with people, and there's an overpowering smell of artificial butter and sponge sugar. Mm. We are surrounded by kiosks for spell-offs, face painting, a wheel to spin for prizes, and other activities best for small children or the very easily amused. The fair continues with a selection of carnival games to the west, and with open park to the north and east. My score has gone up to three points, and is now four. You can pick up things when you see them like this. Take the wheel. Can we try it? We take the wheel. It's the sort of game where you spin the wheel for a prize. Nobody seems to be manning or using it anymore, though. Perhaps the supply of prizes has run out. But the wheel is too large for us to carry, and falls onto the ground. To save your current position, type save. Restore allows you to bring back a game you have previously saved. So let's... Remember the mantra. Save early, save often, and don't overwrite saves. Let's name this file tutorial. The map and compass can be switched off by typing map off. If you change your mind later, switch them back on with map on. All right. Let's look around again. Okay. Carnival games to the west and open park to the north and east. So let's try going northwest because we're trying to go to the cinema to get our backpack. Church Forecourt. This corner of the park, in the lee of the church, has been left free of kiosks and booths. Contrary to the usual rules of cathedral layout, the new church is oriented toward the north, so we are standing by the flank of the building, though there is an entrance on this side. South and east lead to more of the park. There is a small cinema, where I left my pack, to the north, and the entrance to the new church is west. Cinema Lobby. This is a small, one-screen theater. The seats are not comfortable, and the screen is not large. The projector is old. The management is lazy. No food is served. On two occasions, the film I was watching burst into flames while it was being shown. Funny story, I've actually had a, a film melt um, at a theater when I went to see Mamma Mia. Um, I had never seen a film melt before.
despite these handicaps, it maintains an active and interested clientele simply by virtue of content, a wide variety of foreign films that, though meticulously dubbed into flawless California-accented English, nonetheless carry that slight tang of the forbidden. Evidently, the next showing is not for a little while yet, because there are no patrons in sight. More. Ticket, says the ticket taker automatically. Mm, do I have a ticket? No. Uh, I wonder if I need to go find somewhere that has... Oh, maybe an H remover so that I can turn a thicket into a ticket. So let's look around the park some more. Let's go south. Let's try east a little more. Park Center. This is a handsome expanse of grass shaped like a rectangle with rounds cut from the corners bounded by railings along the north side. There are no stalls and no barkers here, but small children are running around an impressive marble fountain. I gather from the direction of your thoughts that you dislike small children, so I'll refrain from trying to communicate with them. Or I'll restrain myself from trying to communicate with them. Let's look at that fountain. It depicts some horses rising out of the waves with trident-bearing gods on their backs and some nymphs overseeing the whole operation. Probably 17th century to judge by the excessive number of writhing sculpted figures. The fountain celebrates, if that's the right word, the conquest of this island by the Dutch in 1607, it having been a Spanish possession for 140 years before that. In spite of this, the fountain bears not a word of any foreign language, the original Latin or vernacular inscriptions having been long since renovated away. Okay, let's go east a little more. This way will take us away from the cinema, and I'd like to retrieve our things first. Hmm. Let's try southeast. This patch of town square has been paved over in octagonal bricks and is commonly used for displays of traditional dancing. Over 50 women in homemade embroidered aprons skipping arm in arm and jumping over broomsticks. No, there aren't any here now, but trust me, it's an unforgettable sight. Under a bit of shelter in the corner, a diorama table shows scenes from the local history rotated out each week. This week's diorama represents the first sitting of the Committee for the New Orthodox Orthography. The, back, the park continues to the north and west. To the east is a backpacker's hostel where you've stayed and where you've stored stowed the rest of your important possessions. Let's look at that diorama. The patriotic scene is set against the backdrop of the Bureau's buildings, circa 1895, where the committee first met, but the historians have included a bit of the building exterior to show that the meetings were conducted under army guard. The writing of dictionaries has not always been bloodless. The members and the army are movable, but the rest of the scenery appears to have been hot glued in place. Alright, let's continue east to try to get some of our stuff back. I take it this is where you stayed from the time you got to town until our operation. I would have expected that someone with your credentials would have been able to afford something better. The fleur d'or, maybe. 
but maybe you thought this was lower profile. At least it's clean and doesn't smell funny. The desk attendant is sort of eyeing us. She doesn't recognize you, us, but that's a good thing, I think. Discarded in one corner is the guidebook to Anglophone Atlantis. There's a spiral staircase that leads up to the dormitory rooms. You can look up interesting subjects in books if you like. A much-thumbed and several years out-of-date guidebook to this immediate area. The cover is tomato red, but the pages are crinkly and beige. It appears that someone has spilled coffee on it. There's too much here to take in, a quick, in, in a quick read, but we could look up specific topics if we wanted to read more. So let's... We find no reference to committee. The guidebook devotes two and a half pages to the splendors of the new church located on the western edge of the town square. It particularly admires the clean lines of the architecture, the solidly constructed pews, the austere decoration. In fact, the more you read, the more the guide seems to be rhapsodizing about what the builders left out instead of what they put in. The guide also recommends a visit to the church gift shop, which apparently supports assorted worthy causes, such as, for instance, buying a new roof for the structure and paying a custo custodial staff. Achievement accomplished. Finished to p tutorial mode. Oh, golly. We're on our own from here on out. Anyway. Let's look around. Painted off-white with hardwood floors under many layers of protective gloss coating, there are no surfaces in this room that would take a stain. Four dorm beds are lined up against the wall. The locker you identify as your own sits near one of the beds, still locked with its style lock. A girl of about 19 is standing in the middle of the room looking around as though she can't quite believe where she landed or what she's doing here. She is carrying a heavy pack and wearing a pink t-shirt. Hey, says the girl, do you think this place is safe? She asks conspiratorially. I must look blank because she goes on. I saw this documentary once about a serial killer who went from youth hostel to youth hostel grooming girls and killing them, and then he'd chop up the bodies and put the body parts into the lockers, and no one would find out until he'd gone away again. Ugh, nothing like that has happened here, but she seems to get a charge out of scaring herself with the story. I'd like to ask for privacy. Type topics to repeat current conversation topics and suggest new ones. Okay, let's ask whether she had trouble. How was coming through customs, we ask. Any trouble there? Uh, not really. There were a few people in line, and they made me take all my stuff out of my backpack, and this one guy I saw them take it away into a back room and I don't think he ever came out again, but uh, they were nice enough to me, I guess. I was expecting worse. With a grunt, she sh shrugs off her pack and puts it on the ground near one of the beds. Have you tried talking to the desk girl downstairs? I mean, for more than two seconds. She is a total witch that starts with a B, know what I mean? Like, she looked at me like I was completely an idiot, right? And like, what does she expect? Of course I don't know my way around. I just got here. 
Let's agree. I've seen more impressive customer service, you say. You'd think they'd be a little nicer if they want repeat customers, she grumps. I decide not to point out that the hostel is by far the cheapest lodging place on the island, is probably run on subsidies to make it possible for the foreign students to visit at all, and never suffers from any lack of custom. She eyes the beds thoughtfully, punches each of the mattresses in turn, and then climbs into the one she's selected. I hope this place has good souvenirs. I got this snow globe at the Vatican, right? That has the Pope inside, saying, like, a blessing. There's a heavy tread on the stairs, and the desk attendant puts her head in. Just so you two know, you're not actually supposed to be hanging out a lot up here during the day. It's for night use, really. I'm not going to do anything today, but it's kind of against the rules. For future reference. She turns around and goes back down. The backpacking girl sticks out her tongue at the departing back. We want to admire the snow globe or ask for privacy. I bet your friends back home are going to love that. Yeah, she says. Though... I have to keep my souvenir buying light because there isn't much room in my pack. She tosses restlessly. Do you like this place so far? Sure, you say. It's pretty, it's clean, there's lots of interesting stuff around. I can see why your career isn't with a tourist board. I guess... And now we've exhausted other topics. And now we can just ask for privacy. Would you mind giving me a minute, we say. Sorry, I could just use a little privacy. She waves a hand generously. Don't worry about it. Do whatever you've got to do. I don't care, she says. I'm so tired I couldn't move a muscle. But I've seen everything. I have three brothers and two sisters, and I'm in women's rugby, so I'm pretty hard to shock. Okay. Thanks, we say. So now let's open our locker. The backpacking girl is watching our every move with unconcealed curiosity, which makes me a little hesitant to do anything with the locker. Hmm. What can we do? To make her leave us alone. What about set X remover to E? You can also j tune the device by just using another name for it. Referring to the device as, for example, an N remover will automatically set it to N. So that's a good thing to know for future reference, too. All right, so we now have an E-remover, and I'm going to wave E-remover at snow globe. Oh, we don't have a snow globe. Okay. What else can we look at, girl? She's just the sort of tourist who most annoys the locals, but actually I find her type a little endearing. She may not be very sophisticated yet, but she wants to expand her horizons, and that's more than you could say for most of the friends she probably left back home. Hmm. Okay, let's look around. Painted off-white with hardwood floors under many layers of protective gloss coating. Still locked with its style lock. She is sitting on a dorm bed and wearing a pink 
t-shirt. Hmm. How about wave R remover at t-shirt so that she's wearing a t-shirt. <laughs> we smoothly and almost without thinking about it reset your device to be an R remover. That would be intriguingly disgusting if it weren't for the fact that T-shit doesn't describe anything anyone with a functional colon has ever, anyone with a functional colon has ever heard of. Okay, so I guess we can't do a T-shit. Um, we'll have to find something else we can use to distract the backpacking girl. Hmm. Let's go downstairs. Hmm. How about we wave B remover at blouse? We run our thumb over the dial, setting the device to a bee remover. The blouse flickers and there is a brief image of a louse in its place, but a legal override kicks in. The bee remover is hard coded to prevent generating any living creature. Okay, so we cannot turn the blouse into a louse. Let's go back west. We have the members and the army, so let's wave wire remover at army. We reset the device to Y. We wave the Y remover at the army and produce an arm. Severed, because after all, it would be beyond the parameters of the change to generate the person whose body part it is. It is only moderately gory, and most locals get used to seeing this kind of thing as a prank from six-year-olds every Halloween. Still, it might startle a tourist. So now let's go back to a hostel and go up. The girl takes our reappearance in stride. Let's Give arm to girl. Oh, we didn't take the arm. Okay, we have to go back. <sighs> yep, I forgot to take the thing that we just made. Now go back to hostel dorm. Here, have a look at this, we say. The backpacking girl goes a bit green. After a moment to regain her composure, she flees the vicinity. And now we can open our locker. It's curious, now that you look at it, it's a combination lock with a dial 
face, but no one has bothered putting any numerals onto the dial. Okay. Look at the dial. Still no numbers on the dial. My mother had a wristwatch like that once. Always a nuisance. You are reminded of making your lock. Okay, remember making lock. Galley. You were going through the galley cupboards on the yacht. Oh, we were on a yacht. If you're looking for coffee, Slango forgot to resupply, Brock said, descending the galley staircase in a wet speedo. No, the first letter razor, you replied, holding up a portable clock. I need a lock that responds to restoration gel, but nothing else. Ah, Brock toweled his hair. It's in my bunk, sorry. Wanna come look for it? You smiled, a giveaway smile. <laughs> Wish I could, but we're on a deadline. Go put some pants on and bring me the razor. Then we're back in the present. Ah, so we need restoration gel. I wonder if our buddy has that in his backpack. Alright. So, let's... Let's go back to the fair. Let's look west, maybe. Here in front of the pharmacy in the southwestern corner of the town square, various contests have been set up. A strongman hammering contest, a contest to see who can burst the most balloons using a styrofoam dart plane, and so on. I assume you've noticed, though, the word balance, which comes up as high as our hip. On the right pan is an apple. And on the left, a pear. Beside the word balance is a barker in a blue suit, the same regulation blue used by the Bureau of Orthography. The barker is also carrying a tube. Step up and try your hand at the fabulous word balance, calls the barker appealingly. <sighs> I'd like to ask what that gel is worth, ask whether the game is rigged, or ask whether anyone ever wins. Is the gel very valuable, we ask. Is it new and in good condition? Is the entire tube present? <laughs> yes, of course, absolutely, he says, making a gesture as though to show us the gel, but not letting us catch more than the label. The bell of ha the hammering contest clangs. Put the beam out of alignment and win a fabulous prize, says the barker, holding up a tube. We want to ask whether the game is rigged, or whether anyone wins. I know this kind of game, we say in our most jaded voice. The scale is probably nailed in place so that it can't tip. One or two of the crowd standing nearby seem impressed with this line of argument. A small boy whispers to his sister to ask whether that could be true. Nonsense, says the barker angrily. To demonstrate the point, he pushes down in the left pan, and the scales tip and sway. He soon restores them to balance, though. And don't think that will count for you. You have to put them out of balance yourself. No surrogates, substitutes, or alternatives are allowed. The sun gleams off the shiny balance pans. Does anyone ever win? No one has won today, he says, which is not an answer. The crowd mills around, jostling us. One tube of restoration gel to the first person who can unbalance the word balance, cries the barker, glance sweeping the crowd. 
So there was an apple and a pear on the balance scales. Why don't we We set the device to R. With a distinct whiff of vegetable matter, the pear turns into a pea. Just a single green pea. If I weren't violently allergic to peas, I'm sure that would be much more men much less menacing. There is a cheer from the spectators. The word balance tilts slowly but inexorably. The barker looks astonished and displeased, except for a fraction of a second when he just noticeably winks. With exaggerated bad grace, he hands us some restoration gel. There's your prize, and now this contest is over. He stalks away. So now we can go back to the dormitory. And we can use gel on lock. Unfortunately, there's hardly any gel remaining in the tube. Oh, come the fuck on. There isn't enough gel remaining in the little tube for use. Hmm. What if we wave our ear remover at it and make it into a tub? We reset the device to E. There is a flash of cerulean light and the tube turns into a tub. Now a handsome giant sized tub with restoration gel prominently emblazed on the front. We dip out a pea-sized quantity of gel and rub it gently on the lock. With an audible splort, the lock becomes a clock and falls to the floor. It appears to be one of those archetypal alarm clocks that crows at sunrise and generally makes a nuisance of itself. It shows the time to be about 10 to 10. I'm starting to understand how you got into all the places you got into. Not that I judge you or your line of work. Of course. Now that the lock has been removed, the locker swings easily open, revealing a roll, a letter, and some plans. So let's... Look at roll. Now this is more like it. You've got us a tidy little stash of euros here. Look at letter. It's a letter from your brother, printed off anonymously from an untraceable email account that you accessed in town. Nothing that could be followed back to Sango and the yacht. Sis, I'm keeping your wire transfer funds. I want to try for Stanford. I'd say thank you, except that, one, you didn't get it legally. I saw this documentary about teen prostitutes. If that's where it came from, then ew. And two, honestly? You owe for what you put us through after you ran away. Mom and Dad were humiliated that you turned into the prodigal daughter. Your face on milk cartons. Pastor Hughes gave a sermon about it. Mom spent all that time coaching you through spelling practice. You know she doesn't enjoy getting up at 4 a.m., right? You totally threw that in their faces. If you want to come home sometime, fine. But don't come just to see me. If you want to see me, you have to see Mom and Dad, too. Nate. Alright, what else is in there? Plans. Uh, look at plans. The plans are rolled up and stuck shut with a label that reads, Property of Dental Consonants Limited. Unauthorized use illegal. They're just a set of prints from the main computer design, of course, but still extremely informative. To the right engineer, they might reveal the secret of tea insertion for replication by other companies. Oh wow, tea insertion. We can put a tea in something. 
Maybe. These are what you and Brock were originally contracted to lift from the island at a fee in the multiple millions. All right, so I am going to take all. Take the clock. Um, can't take the heavy pack. Take the roll, take the letter, take the plans. And save. Save early, save often. Alright. Now, let's... Go back to the park. We haven't tried north yet. Okay, get the backpack from the cinema. Look at the ticket taker. Not one of this country's best and brightest, but he seems good natured. You could ask when the movie starts, ask what the movie is, ask whether he likes his job, ask whether crime could ever be justified. Ask whether the government is just. Ask whether immigration laws are fair. Ask whether he has ever been in trouble with the law. Ask what he likes to eat. Or ask where my backpack is. Ask where my backpack is. I left my pack in the cinema. Can I just go in and fetch it? I'll come right back out. No need for a ticket. He scowls. We've been getting a lot of people trying to scam us, he says, so I'm gonna say no. That's ridiculous! I'll be right back out. We clean the theater between showings, he says bullishly, so if you've left something in there, we would have found it. You must have left your stuff somewhere else. Do you enjoy being a cinema admission specialist? He looks taken aback, but makes a surprising recovery. Yeah, he says. Yeah, I do. I think it's a job with a great, with a real future. Okay. Ask what the movie is. What's playing anyway? It's a special showing of red. That doesn't seem to be a topic of conversation. Okay, ask when movie starts. When does the movie start, we ask. Oh, um, not until this evening. So why are you asking for our tickets now? Have you ever had any run-ins with the law? That's kind of none of your business, isn't it? Hmm. Hypothetically speaking, do you think a crime could ever be justified? Uh, no, 
he says, because if it's justified, it's not a crime. Like, if you kill someone in self-defense, that's justified, but it's not a crime, so you won't have to go to jail. He glances toward the door as someone contemplates coming in, but then fails to do so. Uh, what's this about? Are you taking a si or survey or something? Uh, let's claim we're taking a survey. Yes? Oh, he frowns. Aren't you supposed to be writing down my answers on a clipboard or something? I'm uh, recording all of this. Makes it easier not to have to write things down during the survey. More scientific, too. Um, okay. He rocks back and forth on his feet. So, are you just collecting data, or do you want to go to the movie, or what? I'm inclined to delay the ticket taker. So, let's ask what he likes to eat. What kind of foods do you like? We ask. Uh, that's kind of a weird question for a survey, he observes, but shrugs. Just a uh, regular food. Hamburgers, pizza... Sometimes I like more Mediterranean stuff, though. Stuffed grape leaves, olive bread, stuff like that. Mmm, I could totally destroy some dolmas right about now. Uh. Ask where he gets Mediter uh, Mediterranean foods. Where do you get go for that kind of food? <laughs> the Babel Cafe is good, he says. There are always lots of university students over there, so it gets kind of crowded sometimes. Okay, let's ask where the Babel Cafe is. So, uh, where is the Babel Cafe? It's quite a walk from here. You have to go along High Street, east of the park, past the roundabout, then down Long Street, and get until you get to Palm Square. You'll see it. It's right next to the university. Let's ask whether the government is just. Do you think the government is just? What, here? Of course. We had universal suffrage before lots of places, right? He says, counting off on his fingers, 1877, and we never had slavery. Plus, there's very little poverty, and there's a high standard of living. Good health care, no complaints here. He tilts his head thoughtfully. I kind of had enough of this stuff in school, he says. We talked about various laws and stuff, but I'm really not into it. When there's a referendum up for voting, I'll look into it and see if it sounds interesting, but in between times, I don't see the point of talking about what the laws are and whatnot. I mean, it's not like you can do anything about them, and they work pretty well, so let's drop it. <sighs> Ask whether... Immigration laws are fair. Do you think our immigration laws are fair? Uh, find someone else to bother with that stuff, he says ungraciously. Hmm. Let's try going to the church. Take me to church. Not a gothic cathedral from the era of when the church was wealthy and secure, but a gallant neoclassical response to the turmoil of the 18th century, when the power of language was just beginning to be evident, and instead of an immutable cosmology, we suddenly had observer consensus reality. What is the need or use of God if it turns out that he gave all the power of creation to Adam when he let him name the animals? An inscription above the altar, picked out in gold paint, reads, oh uh, shit, I can't read Greek, uh, 
My mother volunteers here. I think I should warn you. She is not quite religious, but believes in the cultural value of the building and in having some sort of place where people can go for spiritual respite. She also, I suspect, likes having those great gold letters defiantly foreign and arcane in the heart of the old city. There are side exits, both east and west, and a gift shop occupies the narthex at the south end. Hmm. Let's go off to the east. The corner of the park in the lee of the church has been left free of kiosks and booths. Contrary to the usual rules of cathedral layout, the new church is oriented toward the north, so we're standing by the flank of the building, etc., etc. Okay. What else can we do? Go back to the fair. Okay, so that's not likely to help us today. Um, go east. Why don't we... Let's take the members. Maybe we can turn them into embers and set off the fire extinguisher in the theater, maybe. Except there are two M's, so I wonder if we're still allowed to do it. But let's go to cinema. Ah, uh, yeah, it removes both of the M's. So, we're going to need a first letter shaver if we're going to do anything with the members. Okay. How about... We just... Buy a ticket. I'd like to buy a ticket to this movie, we say. The ticket ticker shrugs. If you give me money here, I actually have to go give you a ticket, he says. Er, I don't actually have to give you a ticket, he says. I think about raising some discussion about why the theater bothers with a ticketing procedure at all and whether this will ruin their accounting about the number of available seats, but you're right that that would probably make us more memorable than we want to be. He accepts a bill and that's that. We now have movie access. All right. The screening room. Red has not started yet and is probably not destined to start for some time. At any rate, the screen is blank and no audience has yet assembled. My backpack is stowed under a seat in the third row from the back. I figured that it would be undisturbed there for a couple of hours in the dark and out of sight. And if anyone found it, they would probably turn it into Lost and Found. But it is a big relief to find it still there. There are a flash drive and a monocle in the backpack. We can go north and east to the cinema lobby from here. Well, let's take our backpack. We get the backpack, mine. A little worn, but capacious. It doesn't have any identifying marks on it and I thought a brand new bag would look more suspicious. It's closed. All right, go to park. Now let's look at my inventory. So let's look at 
flash drive. This is it, all my notes, the syllable and word generating programs from which I built my language vocabulary, the lexicon and pronunciation guide, and grammatical descriptions. And then there's the research to support the product, citations, copies of journal articles, and scans from the books, contact information for people in the outside world, I think it could help me. It's everything I've been working on for the last three years. Okay. Now let's look at the monocle. This is no mere fashion accessory. It's the very top grade of authentication scope, designed for people who have to use them all day and normally available only to employees of the Bureau of Orthography. If we look through the monocle at something, we can see its true nature, regardless of spelling changes. You like that? I thought you might be impressed. My father got it for me. For research, he said. But I think he knew I just coveted them. At any rate, you're not the only one with equipment. All right. So now we have a monocle that lets us see what a word, uh, what an object really is. Like, if it's ever been anything else. which tells us whether the restoration cream will work on it without us having to use the restoration cream or try to and waste it. So for example, let's try use monocle to look at, oh wait, I don't think we're, we're carrying anything that we've changed recently. Anyway, let's try east because it's the only direction we haven't been yet. The monumental staircase. Once the central hillock of the city was a fortified enclave protected from the harbor and the peasant town by great walls. Now, however, the walls are mostly gone except for a little spur that runs north from here. The walkways and tower are open to the public. Meanwhile, a staircase as wide as a street descends east from the town square toward the harbor. An enormous blue and orange warning poster covers the wall alongside the staircase. We can go north, south to Heritage Corner, southwest of the fair, east and west of the park center from here. So let's look at the poster warning have you seen these dangerous individuals if so avoid contact and report all interactions to the bureau of orthography below there's a picture of several people one of them is you before your face got shuffled with mine it's funny that when we met you were you mentioned you were a user of illegally modified language tools but you didn't emphasize the grand larceny side so much not to worry, I won't turn you in. I can hardly afford to, can I? And we're lucky for that, aren't we? Wonder if we can do anything to the poster in order to make it not a poster. Let's see, I don't think oster is a word. Powder probably wouldn't work. Poser, we can't make anything living. Uh, no, I don't think we can do anything with it. How about we just take the poster? Now, defacing official property is illegal, like many other things we've done recently, but more than usually likely to attract attention. Well, screw that. Let's check our goals. Okay, now we need to just go to the counterfeit monkey. We make the hike over to High Street. 
Unfortunately, the sidewalks, which were never very wide to start with, are so blocked off by the mass of protest protesters that it's impossible to get by. Besides, if we associate with them, we might wind up getting arrested on minor charges anyway. We need some kind of automotive transport. So, here we are on High Street. Hustle, bustle, dirt. Ugly American chain shops. Lots and lots of people. There seemed to be a large organized protest in progress. Protesters completely crammed the sidewalk to the southeast. The curb is lined with garbage. To the west, the street turns into a monumental staircase leading to the old fortified area. A cross street heads southeast toward the main roundabout. From a loudspeaker nearby comes the electronic sound of simulated bells ringing the hour after noon. It's later than I thought. We'd better get a move on. Okay, how about we wave a bee remover at the garbage? We reset the device to B. There is a salmon cloud and the garbage turns into a garage. It is a small, but well-furnished garage for minor tune-ups and repairs. It even comes with a mechanic. A surprising touch, since letter removers are usually illegally prevented from creating living persons. But sometimes there are glitches if the people are not created directly. Alas, however, it doesn't come with a car in residence. The mechanic nods at us. We nod. Just two people nodding coolly. Alright, so we need a car. Let's see. Uh, the Mode 7 album just uh, disappeared into other stuff. We just want the instrumental things for now. Oh, overclocked remix. Why does SoundCloud always autoplay right into another album. It's frustrating. Alright. Look at shops. Our eyes pass over them without recognition or attention. Really, there's nothing here of any use. It's almost all women's shoes and clothing, overpriced coffee, toiletries made with products from half a world away. <sighs> Look at our garage. Small but well furnished, doesn't come with a car in residence. And... I'm going to pause here for a quick break, so I will be right back.
All right, we're back. So we need something that can turn into transportation. Let's go back to the church. Because there are a couple of things we haven't looked at. Check my scroll back. It's an invigorating climb up the monumental staircase with the view of the sea getting better and better as we go. But of course, looking requires stopping to gaze back over our shoulder. Then we make the short walk among the crowds. And here we are back in the church. Let's look at inscription. It means, in the beginning was the word. A patchy attempt to make theology align with scientific and linguistic reality, but it still has power. And despite the Bureau's depredations of foreign language writings everywhere else, they have never quite had the nerve to deface this. Okay, let's try going west. One might expect a graveyard, but burial inside the city walls has been forbidden for sanitation reasons since well before the new church was built. Instead, there's a small meditation garden which was once designated as an integrate intricate knotwork of shrubs. The knotwork has since grown into a thicket. Well, shit, there was our thicket. Oh. Do I want to wave my H remover at it anyway, just in case we ever need a ticket? Ah, uh, that's right, I have to have a hyphen in there. We reset the device to H. The thicket abruptly shrivels and flattens itself, and in its place, a ticket flutters to earth. We pick up the ticket. It reads, ADMIT 1, in large black letters. I'm sure it'll be useful for something else. Let's try the gift shop. This area used to be a sort of antechamber where the priests and choir might gather for processions into the church, but it has now been done over for retail purposes. This is one of several schemes to make the new church pay for its own upkeep. A uh, problem is that people somehow feel everything associated with a church ought to be free, including lunchtime concerts, potluck suppers, and Thursday night lecture series. The elderly man in charge of the gift shop nods at us as we come in. 
A long line of dusty tomes are lined up on one of the shelves, marked free for taking. None are missing. So, tell me, what should I be looking for in the new church, we ask. Other than God, he asks dryly. Mm, the volunteers aren't very well trained, are they? I was expecting something about the points of architectural interest. Alright. So I can ask whether he believes in God, whether there are points of architectural interest, ask why he is here, ask whether he approves of government, or ask why he isn't at the celebration. Hmm. Let's ask whether there are points of architectural interest. Are there... Uh, points of architectural interest about the church, we persist. Not that I know of, his voice quavers. Could I interest you in the purchase of a souvenir tea towel? Or a shot glass? Or perhaps a paper model of the church? Eh, we want to decline to buy a trashy souvenirs. He gives a resigned, what can you do, shrug. Ask why he isn't at the celebration. I'm surprised you're here and not outside enjoying the festivities, we comment. Uh, the prizes and the candy are for kitties, he says. The part I like best's what comes later, the fireworks. They're always first rate. Ask how to see the fireworks. Really? I wouldn't want to miss that. Er, no, that's us. Really? I wouldn't want to miss that. How do we see the fireworks display? It's after dark, he says, naturally. But you'll be able to see it from anywhere around, not to worry. They fire the blasts off over the water, but uh, you can see them from miles off. Okay, so we can see the fireworks from anywhere. What else can we ask? Ask why he is here. If you aren't interested in this place, why do you volunteer here? We ask. His left eyelid twitches. The rosehip woman, he says after a moment. She's a looker. I'm not sure what's more disturbing. Someone expressing attraction to my mother. That person being a good 30 years her senior. Or the use of the phrase, she's a looker. Which... Even this old c character probably got from a movie. Remind him Mrs. Rosehip is married. My mother... We begin shortly before you catch me. Sorry about that. Always tells me it is unwise to chase after married women. We finish lately. He shakes with laughter. <laughs> Bless you, he says. I'm not chasing after anyone. At my age, you just like a bit of good scenery. You're not hard on the eyes yourself, you know. He looks at us keenly. He looks at us thoughtfully, and I almost have the feeling he knows something I don't want him to know. You should keep moving. Don't waste time, he says. Hmm... Okay, look at tomes. Looking at one gives a sense of all. Extremely dusty, learned, and virtuous, such that I almost fall asleep just looking at it. It's nothing so ribald as the Bible, or even a hymnal or order of service. It appears rather to be a selection of sermons of the 18th century from a period when it was 
considered somehow exciting to sit through a three-hour discourse on theology. Okay, I would assume that um, this would have been an alternative solution to the uh, puzzle in the hostel, taking a tome and then turning it into a toe. But let's take one anyway in case it's useful. We reach for one of the volumes, then stop, indecisive. They really do seem to be a set, and I can't bring myself to break it up. Okay. We're not allowed to do that, then. <sighs> so, let's... What else can we do? Let's go back to the city walls. Cause there are probably places we can go from there. It's a quick walk among the booths of the fair. We can go north. And I think that's where we want to go. Only portions of the old walls still stand, but you can walk along what remains, as though you were defending the place. They're a meter and a half wide, made of ashlar blocks. On the vertical faces, these blocks are still rough, but underfoot, they have been worn smooth by the passage of many defenders and, subsequently, tourists. One of the blocks in the wall has even been defaced. Some old inscription gouged out. I used to like to climb around here when I was a kid. I made believe... Uh, oh, you'll think it's silly. Uh, down below in the distance are the docks and the sea. And immediately east of here is an old hexagonal turret. Something makes you think of my youthful pranks. Oh... I used to play that I was an Atlantean guard, defending the battlements against invading redcoats, armed only with a saber and an, uh, an o-removing musket. So they turned into red cats, you see. My mother explained later that letter removal hadn't even taken the form of muskets, and I had my chronology wrong. So I do know better. And my father gave me an even longer and less interesting lecture about how the British colonial government quote-unquote wasn't entirely a bad thing and how it didn't do to be too gleeful about mentally shooting some young soldier who probably didn't have a choice about being there. Then we're back in the present. So let's look around again. Down below in the distance are the docks and the sea, and immediately east of here is a hexagonal turret. Let's see. There are three directions I can go, north, east, or west. Let's try looking at the turret. So, east. Up here, we stand on the remains of the old fortifications. This turret offers a view out over the docks, the fish market, and the harbor, which it was designed to protect. A heavy, old, depluralizing cannon is aimed out to sea. Oh my. Like a conventional cannon, it has a mounting to allow the users to turn the gun and change its angle to hit objects at various ranges. It is currently unloaded, of course, but time was when this vast weapon was employed to reduce entire fleets to a single ship and a whole crew of marines to a single man. This tactic was found so effective that the harbor was never successfully taken. Okay. Let's go back west. Now let's try... Let's continue on north to the sea first. The wall once continued north from here. 
some distance before curving northwest around the remainder of the city. So much has crumbled away, though, that the walkway is impassable north of this point. To protect citizens, there is a safety railing across the, bro the broken edge. A metal ladder of four rungs descends the interface of the wall, allowing pedestrians access to the streets to the west. Among the rubble fill of the wall is an odd spiral-shaped rock. The spiral rock turns out to be a fossil from one of those sea creatures long ago. But if we use the monocle on the rock... Oh. Where are the monocle? Everything turns computer monitor green when viewed through our right eye, and staring fixedly at anything will turn up its authenticity status. So, how about we look at the rock again? It is, perhaps, an inch and a half long, the shape of a corkscrew... Uh, the shape of a corkscrew she seashell... Uh, she sells seashells down by the seashore that once housed something small and soft. There are thousands of these things around. They're not exactly valuable, but an interesting curiosity all the same. The monocle pings happily as we sight the fossil with the crosshairs. Yeah, we find nothing of interest. Okay. But let's take the rock. Maybe we can... Uh... Well, we wouldn't be able to take it, turn it into a rock ROC like the bird because, again, we can't make living creatures directly. Which is unfortunate because I would have liked to have the ability to make a giant frickin' eagle out of a little tiny snail shell. Anyway, let's go west. Here below the wall is a broad, plainly paved court. Lending its name to the location is a bronze statue of Noah Webster. My mother likes to irritate my father by quoting what his contemporaries called Webster. A viper, a maniacal pedant, and, always a favorite reform day parties, a toad in the service of san of saint culottism. She makes sure to pronounce that in the most Parisian accent possible. Uh, wouldn't sans culottism be without pants? In the service of pantsing, I guess. The large building just to the north, yes, the one in pale pink, is my parents' home. I think I mentioned that my parents were well off. My father works for the Bureau, embarrassingly, and my mother was born into the kind of money that we like to pretend doesn't exist on this island. Hmm... The streets continue south, east, and west. And just to the northeast is my parents' side garden. So there might be stuff in the garden we could look at. Uh, I want to know what reform day is. So let's uh, open backpack. Take... Shit, what was the name of the thing? Thing that we've got a uh, take guide book. Um, look up Reform Day. And we find no reference to Reform Day. Look up No Webster. Eh, no, nothing. Okay. 
clothes, backpack. Alright. It's that hero of spelling reform and personally responsible for the island going over to Americanized spellings over the British standard. Now, that's also important because that means that there will be a bunch of superfluous U's that aren't in the way of our U remover and stuff. Alright, well... Let's go into the garden. A narrow strip of land between the house and the edge of my parents' property. The eastern edge right, runs right up to the decaying old wall of the city, which here means some stumpy masonry on this side and a dizzying drop on the other. The rest of their terraces and gardens are fenced off. A little shard grows in the nearest bed, carefully tended to thrive in this climate. Because it's so linguistically productive, shard is something of a national symbol. And during the World Wars, there was a fad of gardening at home. After the war, it became common for affluent people with a little bit of land to keep their own garden, so that if you were down on your luck, you could glean a few leaves. Well... I think I know what to do with this. Let's wave D remover at shard. With a distinct win whiff of faint fishiness, the shard turns into a char. It's a trout-like freshwater fish of the northern countries. It is dead, needless to say, and would make someone a nice supper if they knew how to clean and cook it. Our skills, however, are not up to the task. There is a dismissive blat from the monocle, and transposed over the char is a faint greenish image of some shard. Hmm. Now, we can wave an H remover at the char. We reset the device to H. With a distinct whiff of metal parts and oil, the char turns into a car. It is little larger than a toy, but that is what you want driving on the streets around here. Any substantial vehicle wouldn't fit down the winding drives. Here is how my mother gets around. She takes a 300 euro Hermes scarf with an orange border and a pattern of prancing horses. She tosses it into the air. As it falls, she shoots it twice like a clay pigeon, wants to take off the F, the second time for the S. And that's how sh and such a car, buttery leather seats, jaguar lines. If someone asks how she gets such good results, she jokes it's because of her quality materials. Suffice it to say that we are not similarly blessed. We open the car door. Perhaps unsurprisingly, it comes without an effective lock system. We get into the car. The extremely primitive dial in front of us is pointing all the way to the left. I think that's its way of saying it's out of fuel. At any rate, the engine won't start. Oh... So we need gasoline or fuel of some kind. Well, all right, get out of car.
Let's try... South. Hesychius Street. As the street names make obvious, this part of town was laid out in a different political age, when it was considered more important to commemorate linguistic richness than to standardize practices. On holidays like today, this street is often host to a farmer's market, though it is now late enough in the day that most of the farmers have given up and gone home, taking with them their 23 varieties of pickled olives, their loganberry jam, and their pig's feet in aspic. One remaining farmer lays is here, watching his stall. It appears to belong to the farmer. It's made of wood and canvas and offers little shade against the harsh sun. Previous customers have cleared most of it off, but the farmer still has some asparagus, a lime, and a yam. The monocle pings happily as we sight the farmer's stall with the crosshairs. <sighs> Don't think we can do much with asparagus, a lime, and a yam. Let's try north again and west. Roger Close, a pleasantly sheltered lane in which I learned to ride a bicycle and where my friend Lucy used to live before she and her parents moved off island. Restrictions were looser even 20 years ago. Our old schoolhouse is just west of here. If you look just north between the houses, you'll notice also the footpath down to an almost primitive beach, or an almost private beach. It used to be open, but it's now gated off, and built into the gate is a chic modern sculpture. Hmm. Let's see how far north we can go. We lack a key that fits the gate. Uh, let's look at the sculpture. The base of the sculpture is a cone, about four feet tall. On top of that is a flat circular pedestal, and there's a mirror that rotates around the outer circumference. The mirrored surface faces inward, so that it is sometimes reflecting whatever might be on the pedestal, currently nothing, and sometimes concealing it from view. The monocle pings happily as we sight the pedestal with the crosshairs. So I'm guessing that... There's... going to be something that we can mirror to get something else. But for now, they can't go anywhere. Well, let's go back east. And let's try north from here. Walking into my parents' house is the action perhaps most likely to get us caught. Well, shit. What have I got? A backpack, a flash drive, my H remover, a monocle, some plans, a roll, and a tub of restoration gel. I'm also carrying an arm, a clock, a fossil, the guidebook to Anglophone Atlantis, a letter, some members, and a ticket. Hmm. 
Okay, to get fuel, we, mm, let's look at the car. The only Oh, that's right. It's in the garden. Okay. Our car. Oh, at our feet is a patch of soil. We reset the device to S with a distinct whiff of mechanics and the summertime, the soil turns into some oil, a can of what appears to be motor oil. It is sludgy and black. There is a d dismissive blat from the monocle and transposed over the oil is a faint greenish image of some soil. Let's put oil in car. And my limited interactions with motor vehicles, I've always taken the machine to a garage for any corrective work. That includes topping up the oil. So, let's see here. In order to make the car more compact, why don't we put used gel on car. And the car becomes some shard, and let's take the shard. We pick the shard, leaving bare soil behind. A flicker of curtains from inside the house suggests that someone saw us. A cleaner, possibly. But then there is a voice, not audible except as a confident rising and falling tone. This will be my mother, saying not to worry and not to interfere. Oh boy. Let's... go to the garage. We make the healthy walk out of the cocooning silence of the wealthy streets and back among the fair booths. The mechanic nods at us. Let's use a tree. Wave H remover. Shard. No. Well, yes, that works too. Let's wave the edge remover shard and it will make a card. We reset the device to H. With a distinct whiff of crisp, snappy cardboard, the shard turns into a card. Not a playing card as I might have expected, or a calling card, or even an index card, but a tarot card representing the chariot. How appropriate. The vehicle is drawn by two prize horses, one black, one white. The driver appears to be having some difficulty keeping them together, to judge from the surly expression and the raised whip. There is a dismissive blat from the monocle. <sighs> now, let's wave deer remover at the card. We reset the device to D. The card gives way to the now familiar car. The car is far too large for us to carry and falls onto the ground. And now we can ask why the car doesn't run. There appears to be something wrong with my car, we tell the mechanic. He has the somewhat cow-like expression of all fake people, but he nods gravely and has a look. It hasn't been ma maintained, he says on inspection. You got any motor oil? Yes, we do. Oh, did we not? take the oil with us. Uh, let's go to the garden. Oh, that's the church garden. Go to parents' garden. 
then go to vegetable garden. <sighs> go to villa. And go to Webster Court. Take the oil. Now go to the garage. Will this work? We hold out the oil. Uh, should do, he says. Rolling up his sleeves, he goes to work on the car. There is no small amount of banging and muttering, but finally... He stands back and announces that he believes it is now in working condition. I'd like to thank the mechanic. Thank you. That was a great help, we say. He nods. We want to ask whether the car is fixed. Is the car fixed now? The oil is in, the mechanic says. Might be it's out of fuel, though. Do you have any gas? Or do you know where we could find some? He chews on his tongue a couple of times and then notes that he heard gas comes from old plants. Hmm. Well, yes, it does, but... <sighs> trying to get gas from Can't do it with asparagus unless I'm supposed to let's see. No, I don't think I can do it with asparagus. Cause I would need something that Let's look at my goals. Find transport, fuel the car, and go to the counterfeit monkey. My music ended again. Let's just start that over again and make sure it didn't autoplay again. Okay. It's just playing the last track. Why don't we grab some new jams to put on? Give me just a second.
about. Those are some properties. Okay. So, okay. West. Let's wave at the farmer. The farmer makes a little cluck sound, which seems to mean that he sees us, but doesn't wait, care to waste an entire syllable on acknowledging it. I'd like to ask what is for sale. What is for sale, we ask. We have some asparagus, a lime, and a yam. The farmer replies. We want to recommend other vegetables. Have you ever considered selling radishes? We ask. Not really, he says. Radicchio? No. Chicory? We try again. Cabbages? Carrot? Corn? Again, no. Radishes? You already said radishes. He has the faintly martyred expression of one humoring us, but it doesn't look as though he has much else to do. Let's see what else we can talk about. We can ask what is for sale, ask what the fair is for, or ask whether he wears overalls. <laughs> ask what the fair is for. What is all this about anyway? Cereal day, the farmer answers inaccurately, is to celebrate I guess, grains? And other agricultural products, he adds. Okay. Ask what is for sale. I got some asparagus, a lime, and a yam. It looks particularly tender and pleasant, but I avoid the stuff. Look at lime. A small, wrinkled, intense-looking fruit. It wouldn't give much juice, but it is likely very strong. And we can look at the yam. A yam with whiter skin. Some of the dirt of the farm still adheres to it. The monocle pings happily as we sight the yam with the crosshairs. I'll have the yam, please, we say. Sure thing, says the farmer. Now let's... 
Oh, we make the walk. Roger, close. Etc. Etc. You are reminded of your cruise skill. Remember, cruise skill. A room in a villa. The bed was draped with sheer salmon-colored fabric. The bedroom opened without doors, straight onto the bathroom with a full view of the spotlit bathtub. The toilet was hidden by a frosted glass panel etched with leaping fish. It was the swankest place you'd ever seen, and it made you uncomfortable. Belongs to a seafood magnet, your crewmate Brock was explaining. He was in the middle of setting up a directional mic pointed out across the window. The head of R&D at Sibilant Solutions lived right across the way. What you learned from his pillow talk was enough to recover the three missing Marquesses. Then we're back in the present. I wonder what my cruise skill will have to do with all of this. Anyway, north. Look at gate. Look at sculpture. Let's see what happens. We put the yam on the pedestal. The mirror rotates in a leisurely fashion, and when it is done, there is a May. This is the sheet for the month of May, torn from a calendar. Someone has put a gold star on the 21st, and dinner with the Shapleys is penciled onto the 30th. There is a dismissive blat from the monocle, and transposed over the May is a faint greenish image of a yam. The gate clicks open. We'll take May just because. We slip between the houses and down a path that looks th as though it might lead to someone's backyard. No one has ever put up signage to correct this misapprehension because no one who lives around here is eager to encourage strangers onto the private beach. Soon, however, the footpath begins to descend purposefully towards the level of the ocean. Winding Footpath The footpath winds between the villas, sloping steeply downward. It is narrow, and bushes left and right conceal it even from the windows of the people living nearby. Hmm, bushes. Some variety I'm not familiar with. Dark, glossy green leaves, thick stems. In the right season, and I can't remember what kind of season that is, they also grow gaudy pink flowers, but not now. Loads of kudzu grows through and over the bushes. <laughs> a pity I can't use a Z remover and make kudu, huh? This is one of the few spots on the island where it hasn't been eradicated, it seems. At one point along the path, the bushes stick out especially far, as though there's something behind them. Look behind bushes. Uh, it's hard to get a good look under the bushes with all this kudzu in the way. Well, even if it turns into a dead kudu, we can try it. Z remover on Kudzu. Yep. Nope. <sighs> okay, why don't we continue north? This is little more than a strip of fine yellow sand perhaps 20 meters from side to side, and five from the hillside to the waterline. A little sage, oh, 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 grows on the hillside, escaped from some garden along with wilder plants. Above, at the top of that slope, are houses with balconies overlooking the sea, but from this angle it's impossible to see much of them, or for them to see us. You'll have to take my word on this. It's 
tempting to look for crabs among the rocks, but the tide is high just now, and even at the best of times, this is not an area rich in sea life. More. Something green and plastic just barely pokes out of the sand. Look at green thing. Look at plastic. We pick up the funnel. It's a funnel. A gaudy green plastic toy suitable for funneling water and shaping conical sand turrets. It's all sandy. Of course it is. We've brushed away most of the adhering sand, but there are always going to be a few grains left. Well, we've got a sandy funnel now. Now, let's go back and get the sage. We get the sage. Dark green leaves furred with silver prickles. Now, let's use the E-Remover. There is a flash of psychedelic colors, and the sage turns into a sag. The sag comes in the form of a doll-sized house with a distinct dip in the roof. <laughs> okay. Now, let's... Go back south and look at gate. Let's find the pedestal. Okay, south again. Look at gate. The mirror rotates in leisurely fashion, and when it is done, there is some gas. It looks like a generic canister of unleaded gasoline. Well, let's take the gas and go back to the garage. Ah, <sighs> Webster Court, a broad and plainly paved court named for the statue of Noah Webster. The door to my parents' house opens, and my father comes out. He's talking over his shoulder. Sorry, dear, but someone has to be on call. My mother answers from inside, but we can't make out what she's saying. Surge on the grid, father replies. Could be an unauthorized synthesizer, but more likely... Uh, yes, exactly. I'll try to be home before the fireworks. He closes the door behind him. Hastily, I take off our monocle and palm it. Father shouldn't recognize us in our current body, but wearing expensive bureau equipment would be a terrible idea. We open the backpack. We put the monocle into the backpack. Let's close our backpack. We don't dare drawing Father's attention. I'm going to have a stand over here, as though checking the health of the neighbor's lawn, shall we? My father sees us from a distance and gives a neighborly wave. Happy punctuating, he shouts. I wave back rather weakly. He gets on his small red scooter, checks his helmet, and revs off to the south. Off, apparently, to investigate the synthesizer that put us together. 
That will go slowly because of the holiday, but I'm guessing there will be bureau investigators crawling all over the south side of this old town in an hour or two. Well, good thing we're up on the north side of town then, isn't it? Let's... Where were we? Our garage, right? Uh, go to garage. Alright, here we are, back in our garage. Now let's... Give gas to the mechanic. Could you help me with this? We ask, indicating the gas. Just pour it in, he says. Put gas in car. I deeply fear automotive maintenance, but I can just manage to pour in the fuel. And I think that's done it. Your score has gone up by three points and is now 21. And I'm going to call this file gas, gas, gas. Let's see what we've done so far. So far, I have earned 21 points. One point for using the letter remover. Three points for passing through the temporary barrier. Three points for winning the gel, one point for using the gel, three points for opening the locker, three points for retrieving the backpack, three points for fixing our car, one point for using the spinner, and three points for fueling our car. Alright, excellent. Let's get in the car. Now, can we go to the counterfeit monkey? We close the car door, we switch on the ignition, and the car comes to life. Smelly, trembling, putt-putting life, but still not bad for something we conjured out of a vegetable picked outside of my parents' place. Once we get to Deep Street, we try, unsuccessfully, to fit into a spot even smaller than the car before lucking into a freshly vacated place. Not very fishy at the moment, the fish market. In fact, all the real trade happens in the early morning, when there is a period of tourist trade when the seafood sale tails off, and most of the purchases are of polished conch, set, blah, blah, polished conch shells and starfish, and then a little after noon, the area clears out completely, leaving only briny rivulets on the concrete. A tall, stern woman is standing in the middle of the market. She wears the black-caped uniform of an authenticator and a monocle just like mine, and I don't think I want her to see us. Just east of here is a rusting, corrugated tin building, which was built to house various possessions of the fishermen. Right. Can we, however, slide by north to go to the monkey? You assess the distance and work out that there's too much open space between us and cover. Okay, then let's go to the hut. Most of the light in here comes from the circular windows punched into the tin walls just under the ceiling. From inside, the building looks both larger and more sound than it appears from outside. There are plenty of sturdy struts supporting the roof and keeping the walls upright. Various tarpaulin-covered masses fill the room. A trapdoor is set in the floor. Sometimes smugglers and forgers have been known to stash things in here, since the building is close to the docks, but rarely attracts the interest of customs officials. We catch our breath and look over our belongings to see if anything suspicious is showing. The e-remover, the monocle, and the plans might be a little too conspicuous. Ominous sounds come through the windows, but we're at the wrong angle to see out. 
put everything away. Okay, put ear in the in backpack. Can we close our backpack? We close the backpack. More racket comes in through the windows. Look at trapdoor. It is a wooden door set into the floor. The hinging mechanism is designed to keep the door closed, if possible, perhaps as a safety feature so that people won't fall into an open hole. The trap door makes a creaking noise and slams shut again. They must prop it open when they use it. <sighs> From the shapes visible under the blue plastic, it appears that there are probably tables and stalls, buckets, signs, and other necessary features of the fish market when sales are in progress. There is a flattish area we could probably scramble onto. Alright. We identify the sturdiest looking part of the construction and clamber onto it. Okay, a natural impulse, but I don't think she's coming in here. And if she did, the last thing we'd want would be to ca be caught hiding. The key thing is to be in plain sight and obviously innocent. Hmm. So there are various tables, stalls, awnings. to prop up that door. Got a backpack, my e-remover, a flash drive, a monocle, some plans, a roll, and a tub of restoration gel. I have an arm, a clock, a fossil, a funnel, a guidebook, a letter, the month of May, some members, and a ticket. Hmm.
I wonder if I can prop up the trap door with my arm. We prop the trap door open with the arm. I can't believe that worked. Crawl space. An awkward, low, concrete-lined crawl space beneath the tin hut. It smells somewhat like animals. In spite of this, it clearly gets a bit more use than anyone would like the customs officials to know about. The trap door, wedged open by an arm, admits the only light. The only significant thing down here is a crate. Well, let's look at the crate. We see nothing special about the crate. Well, why don't we put better motor in the backpack? Close backpack. Put backpack in the crate. They open the crate, revealing a watch, a band, and a single discarded leaflet. It's a subversive tract, attacking the state's line on punishing people with inanimate status. It quotes the official just state justification from the days when they bothered to justify it at all as follows. There are those who argue that it is just as inhumane to make a man inanimate as to kill him, and indeed it is a form of execution in that the man is wiped out and some other thing replaces him. Execution that is, in every detail, but one. It is reversible. Many men have been executed in error, going innocent to the electric chair or the noose, and once dead, they can never be retrieved. The personality of a man made inanimate, however, stays behind in the changed object, ready to be retrieved should new evidence come to light. And until that date, he is harmless to society, and costs almost nothing to store, as compared to the costs of prison guardianship and maintenance. It follows up by discussing the problems with this argument, the tendency of objects to fade over time so that their original form is completely lost. Oh my. So, if you leave something transformed for too long, then it's stuck like that. The fact that an inanimate ar object can hardly direct its own appeal proceedings the strong words against this kind of punishment in the Geneva Conventions. Alright. There's a watch and a band. Let's look at the watch. An apparently valuable watch with diamonds set into the face. Hmm. But it's not going to be valuable to us. So let's look at the band. The paper strip used to keep printed materials together before distribution. Now that might be useful. We might be able to turn it into a band. 
or an and. So why don't we take that? We get the band. Anyway. Why don't we... Save before we go outside leaving all of our stuff in a crate in a crawl space. <sighs> okay. Up. Most of the light in here comes from circular windows, etc., etc. Now we can go west. I don't think we want to show, show off the plans around the authenticator. Okay, no. Let's go back down. Put plans in the backpack. And the plans would just stick out. Hmm. Now let's put the plans under the crate. Can we go now? Can we go? Okay, it won't let me leave everything behind in the crate. What if we... We reset the device to L. There's a flash of canary light, and the plans turn into some pans. A set of flat skillets in cast iron, extremely bulky and heavily heavy. Now wave S remover at plans. Oh, I can't depluralize that way. Or wave S remover at pans. There. Now it is just one pan. We put the pan into the backpack.
have that collection, the flash drive, the monocle, and the pack. I put all in the back. pack. Now, can we go? Let's try north. The docks! Here are some dozens of boats tied up. Some of them are small to medium fishing craft, some tourist boats for trips around the island, some merely ferries to the deeper harbor where the cruise ships anchor. To the east, up a moderate rise from the sea level docks, the imposing exterior of the customs house. The classical look is only a little undermined by the public service posters along the front. There, passports are inspected and cargo passed under authentication, foreign items renamed or confiscated, and suspected smugglers interrogated. Immediately west, a sign advertises a pub called the Counterfeit Monkey. Title drop. It's kind of funny that the Counterfeit Monkey is across the docks from the customs house where they look at <laughs> counterfeit objects. Anyway, let's go to the pub. It takes a minute for us to adjust to the light in here. Built when people were a bit shorter and ceilings were a bit lower, the counterfeit monkey is always smoky and never well lit, even in the middle of the day. And Slango is not here. This is bad. Even I can see this is bad. What happened to your confidence in the, your team? Where are the guys who are supposed to get us out of here? Something must have gone wrong. Help you? Asks Parker the bar barman unenthusiastically. Ask whether he has seen Slango. I wonder if you've seen an associate of mine, we say to Parker. Name of Slango. Parker looks over the bar at us. He comes in here from time to time, he says. Very regular customer. Always has about three rum and cokes. This is a lie, and therefore a test. Slango doesn't drink alcohol himself, and doesn't permit drunkenness in his crew. I'm inclined to challenge Parker about the rum. Must be a different slango, we say. Mine's more of a root beer man. Thanks anyway, though. Oh, that slango, Parker says, thoughtfully moving the origin paste sitting on the bar. He's been around town the last couple of days, but not today. If you know his lady friend, you might try her. Lady friend? This can only mean Lena. She being the only female native with whom Slango spends much time socially. But you wouldn't have guessed that she'd advanced to the status of lady friend. Either way, Lena's a rather odd woman who keeps a used bookstore off Deep Street. I'd like to ask whether we can have the origin paste. That origin paste for sale? Well now, he says, grinning. That would surely be illegal, would it not? Origin paste is, after all, a controlled substance in this country due to its unhappy association with fraudulent activities. On the other hand, there is no law against someone winning the origin paste in a completely legitimate game of chance or skill. Ask about winning. Explain this game as though I have no idea what you're talking about, you say, leaning on the bar in an interesting fashion. Are you flirting with Parker? No? Okay, good to know. It's a designated challenge game, says Parker. You've seen this played before, but he explains the rules anyway. There are two contestants, one challenger and one defender. The challenger chooses any object he likes and shows it to the moderator ahead of time. The defender, without seeing the object, stipulates a general category. The challenger has five minutes to turn his designated object into an item that fits the defender's category or he forfeits his ante. 
My response would be to play the game. You have a fleeting thought about past experience playing games. Remember playing games. The three of you were watching the contest at Counterfeit Monkey. This time the prize was a bottle of Dove Wing Absinthe. And the latest con contestant was trying to let her remove her way to an object the size of a pebble. Slango lifted his root beer. These guys are in a rut. It's all make a liquid and size-based challenges. I want to see some demanding categories. Strawberry scented. Paisley. Pachyderm themed. You shrugged. People L remove tiles. You can get a letter made tie any color you want. Import category five, Brock said. Now that would be a strong challenge category. Under Atlantean customs law, import category five means things that are edible, but not fruits or vegetables. Everything from drugs to chicken breasts. Queer, but it rules out a lot of overly productive agriculture words. Then we're back in the present. I would like to play that, we say. Excellent. Oh, did I mention the small matter of the entry fee? I get out the roll of bills and he peels off two twenties. Thank you. Now, pick your entry article and I'll ask one of these good gentlemen to suggest a defense category. Let's see what I've got. I have a backpack, a flash drive, the monocle, a pan, a roll, my S remover, and a tub of restoration gel. Everything I carry is in the backpack for greater concealment. Hmm. Oh, that's because I left everything in the crate. Shit. Why don't we look? around. Infamously, this pub was raided in 1929, the year that the Bureau developed its first meager attempt at an authentication scope, and dozens of smugglers and fraudulent businessmen went to jail. But neither that raid nor the subsequent scrutiny has ever shut the place down entirely. Built when people were a bit shorter and ceilings were a bit lower, the counterfeit monkey is always smoky and never well lit, even in the middle of the day. The clientele are currently enraged, er, engaged in a game of darts, while the barman watches and practices a sarcastic wit on those who embarrass themselves. There's also origin paste. Okay. Why don't we get a dart? We don't really want to attract the attention of those guys. <sighs> Pick something you've got on you and show. Yeah. Let's go back to the hut. Yeah. We've got an ante down. Do we really don't want to leave. No. Uh. Have you picked away draw object yet? What have I got? Um. Flash drive, monocle, pan, my S ribbon for. I think I might have screwed myself. Why don't we restore previous save? Let's go back to stuff in crate. Look in crate. Take all.
Where is the band? Okay, so I do have the band. So let's... Okay, wave. L remover at plans. Wave. S remover at pans. Put pan. there. Oh, take pan. Put pan in backpack. Close backpack. to counterfeit monkey. All right. Now we can go through this whole conversation again. Entry article and they'll suggest a defense category. Okay, let's. Try that. The band it is. Right, says the barman. The band it is. He turns towards the group assembled around the dartboard. Anyone want to defend against this character? With a nod at me. Something smaller than a pebble, suggests a woman in the front row. She passes forward her own ante to the bar and the game is on. Well, let's see if waving a beer remover will make it an ampersand. Yeah. It can't create an and. <sighs> Let's see if we can make a bed. No. We reset. The... Okay, so I can't do anything with abstracts. I wonder if the category is always going to be something smaller than a pebble. If that's the case, why don't we restore...
And we'll put a save right before we uh, challenge about the game so that we don't have to go through this every time. Okay. I have a band, a clock, a fossil. Guidebook to Anglophone Atlantis. A leaflet, a letter, a May, some members, a ticket, and a watch. Okay, how about... How about we... Open backpack. Give fossil to Parker. Alright, the fossil it is. Okay, something smaller than a pebble. Okay. With S remover at fossil. There is a mad scientist cackle, and the fossil turns into a foil, one of those long springy swords used for fencing. Ah, I was hoping for the other kind of foil. Let's try with O remover at foil. Ah, no. 
can't make a filament or something out of it. So why don't we go out? See if there's some other stuff we can use. Because if the category is always going to be something smaller than a pebble, that's important. Don't know if we want to go to the customs house. That would be scary. This one building handles both people entering Atlantis by sea and those leaving. So there is an entry line, which feeds out into the city by the door we used, and an exit line, which snakes through from here to the point where boats and ferries board their passengers. There is a long line of people waiting to leave Atlantis, even on serial comma day. An old-time war poster on the wall shows Atlantida striding boldly forward. No one is paying any attention to us yet, but I wouldn't recommend spending much time here. Okay, so... Not much of use here. Let's try going south to the fish market. Let's go south to the outdoor cafe. From this slightly raised terrace, tourists have a view of the activity in the market and out over the docks. Curiously, there's an acquaintance of yours here, Nexami, Eng Nexami Engio. is at one of the round black metal tables. He is a musician, the front man of Engio. Your gang helped him out with some customs issues because of his unusual name. Watch out! The table next to you has something sticky spilled on it. And indeed, there is a spill. You are about to lean on it nonchalantly. Hmm. Well... He makes a you're welcome gesture and goes back to contemplating the sea view. Let's ask him what he's doing in Atlantis. Doing a show tonight, he says. Up on the city walls. This is only partly a lie. You know that his main business in town is some sort of computer science contract and that it's largely cover that his band is playing in the serial comma day festivities. Nexami stands up and mutters something. I have little I have a little trouble with his Scottish accent. We don't get a lot of that around here. For obvious reasons, but you interpret him as saying he'd better go pay up. He heads into the interior of the cafe. Okay.
Let's try with the S remover at the spill. There is a mad scientist cackle and the spill turns into a pill. It is small, round, and blue. Okay. Maybe we can turn it back into a spill by rubbing the restoration gel on it. And then, then, we can uh, wave the S remover at it again. And get our thing that is smaller than a pebble. So now let's put S remover in backpack, close backpack, save, and now go to counterfeit monkey. Play the... Hmm. Something makes you think of your crew's attitude to Atlantis Law. You, Brock, and Slango were sitting around the built-in table aboard Slango's yacht using Brock's laptop to plan upcoming jobs. We've got time before Cairo, Brock says. What do you think of this one? Slango grimaced. Pays chicken shit, and what a job. Getting a name like Nexami past Atlantean Border Control so some guy can do a concert tour? Come on, where does that go on our resume? Right after brought down international conspiracy by sibilant solutions? It's hiring a neuro-oncologist to treat your pet gerbil. We've got ourselves credentials, Brock remarked. We're not exactly the most upstanding, ordinary named guys. Because in our line of work, it's not, er, it's useful not to be. Plus, I would do a job for myself that I wouldn't do for anyone else. Obviously. This is a job for a virtuoso, Brock said. Pure challenge. No obvious social engineering solutions. Not to mention, if it turns out we can't deliver, what's this guy gonna do about it? He's a musician. Slango still didn't look impressed. It's breaking Atlantean law, Brock added temptingly. And there's no law that needs breaking more than Atlantean law, you and Slango chorused with him. Point taken, said Slango. Okay, we plant evidence that Nexami is a traditional ethnic Basque name. Uh, you know he was born in Glasgow. Then we're back in the present. Okay. Let's play Right, says the barman. The spill it is. He turns towards the group assembled around the dartboard. Anyone want to defend against this character? 
Something smaller than a pebble, suggests a woman in the front row. As she does every time we've reloaded this save. Alright. Now we can work our magic. We get the S remover. The spill gives way to the now familiar pill. A winner, says the barman, straightening up. What do you know? The origin paste is all yours, darling. This produces a squawk of surprise and irritation from the defendant, and you get the impression that this game has been agreeably fleecing tourists all day. Pity you had to come along and spoil it. We want to ask whether he has any other games going. And first we want to save. So, is there anything else I can win? Any other games going? <laughs> Parker laughs. Not until tomorrow, kid, he says. We only run one game a day. Alright, so let's find out what Origin Paste does. A cake of pale purple. It is able to disguise letter-reformed objects so that they don't look like obvious frauds or even show up under authentication. The only problem with it is the distinctive smell. The origin paste is powerful stuff, and worth a good bit of money. So, we could use that somehow. To make it look like something we've got isn't something that we've changed. Like maybe putting it on the pan to make it look, albeit not smell, uh, like it was always a pan. Okay, so now I want to talk to Lena at the Aquarium Bookstore. So, put all in backpack. Close backpack. And let's go out to the bookstore. Go to Aquarium Bookstore. The shop takes its name from the collection of fish mounted on every wall. Swordfish, bass, other things I don't recognize. Underneath these dubious tokens, the walls are covered with bookshelves, and there are stacks of books on the floor where the shelves have proven insufficient. The merchandise consists mainly, but not exclusively, of books, and the selection caters to odd tastes. You once picked up in here a book about a man who R removed a wrench and then had his way with it. Ew. You and Brock had a good time with that one for the next month and a half. Lena is present all right. In fact, she watches us keenly the instant we come in the shop. Lena's an associate of Slango's. You hadn't realized that had crossed over into a romance. Slango has never, ever, in your recollection, dated anyone. And now this. Happy Serial Comedy, she says. Glad to see you've got plenty of origin paste, Lena remarks. 
It's such a useful thing to have. Smells so nice. I'm inclined to ask whether she has seen Slango. Or say who we are. You wouldn't happen to have seen Slango about recently, we ask. Slango, she asks blankly, for all the world as though she'd had a lobotomy. Is that a board game? Okay, let's try say who we are. Lena, it's Andra and company. Maybe Slango mentioned that I was auditioning a new silent partner. I don't know what you're talking about, she says. But since you're here, whoever you are, I wonder whether you'd like to have a look at some merchandise of mine that could use a spruce. Aha! She wants us to prove our identity, probably has contraband that needs concealing, and wants us to do the deed as proof of trustworthiness. There's a brief pause. Lena goes off into a corner and rummages among the suspicious piles of books and uncovers a box. Come here, she says, and obediently, I wander over to that area of the store, which incidentally happens to be tucked away and half hidden by shelves. See here, she says. See what you can do with it, eh? Okay, let's look in the box. In the contraband box, there are some modems and some preamps. Try doing something with the modems, Lena suggests. Mm. We could turn it into a book of poetry. Wave M remover at modems. We reset the device to M. With a distinct whiff of old book, the modems turn into some oats. A slender volume of poetry bound between red covers. It looks completely harmless and is written in English. The blurb on the back describes it as a collection of meditations on Atlantis's imaginary roots which is to say a lot of stuff about magic-wielding Phoenicians, Knights Templar, refugees from the Tower of Babel, space aliens, Kabbalistic mysticism, and Lully's Combinatorics. It fits in perfectly with the rest of Lena's selection. Really amazing work. I've seen other people who are able to do impressive things with local field distortions. Think hard enough, and you can prejudice the outcome of a linguistic transition. But this? This is detail work like I haven't seen. My hat is off. Or it would be if I were wearing a hat, and taking it off didn't mean making you take it off, too. Lena touches the binding appreciatively. You've even got that little bit of creasing in the spine that makes it look used, she says. This is perfect. Only risk is customers wanting to buy it. But I've got a couple. This would be right up their alley. Now let's use origin paste on oats. We smear some of the origin paste onto the oats. Nothing obvious happens, of course, but that is the whole point. I'm looking forward to what you do with the preamps, Lena says. They should look innocent. Okay, now I remember what to do with this one. In fact, it's one of the only puzzles I remember in this game. Let's wave P remover at preamps. We reset the device to P. There is a flash of blue light and the preamps turn into some reams. Since each ream is 500 sheets of paper, and there are many reams here, 
the collection is unhelpfully bulky. Lena considers the heap of reams contemplatively. That's inconvenient, isn't it? And I have a bookstore, not an office supply shop. We could calm Lena or tease Lena about selling office supplies. Hmm, how about we tease Lena? May I recommend that you branch out into office supply? You ask. It's a lucrative business. Pamphlet printing is very popular with the subversive element. Not as lucrative as untariffed electronics, she says out of the corner of her mouth. Now let's singularize the reams. There is a smell of anise, and the reams turn into a ream, one ream, which is to say 500 sheets of generic printer or copier paper in white white. That works. Kind of thing I might have around for printing out invoices on. I was a little afraid you were going to go for a ram just to spite me. I <laughs> don't know where I'd put one of those around here. Now let's use origin paste on ream. Perfect, Lena says regarding her contraband possessions with satisfaction. Welcome back, Andra and guest. Now, let's ask her about Slango. Now you owe me one Slango, you say. Where'd he get to? Slango and I were catching up. Bless that man, he's hung like a yak. <laughs> oh my, I don't think I wanted to know that about my, uh, co-worker. But he got bad news and had to hurry back to the yacht. Said something about not being able to keep an appointment. I take it you're the appointment? I can try reaching him for you, if you want. Oh, we want. We want very much. Encourage Lena to contact... Not contact. Contact Slango. That would be extremely helpful, we say. Perhaps we can finally get off this island and back into our separate skins. Which would not be one minute too soon for me. Very good, she says. She goes over to one of the freestanding shelves and takes out copies of Queen's English and 70 Ways to Disable an Authentication Scope. Behind these works of literature, she finds what looks like a cellular phone, but it mustn't be one, or at least not one of the usual variety, because the Bureau tightly controls such items. We hear half a conversation. It's me. There is someone to see. Yes, I had her do the contraband. I don't know. She's a little taller and a lot less mean. Oh, I see. She looks healthy enough. I'm not running a restaurant. Okay, okay. I'll talk to you later, sweetie. Bye! Without meeting our eye, 
she buries the phone back in its previous location. Then she says, he's coming in direct. He says, go over to Counterfeit Monkey and he'll be right over as originally planned. And he's sorry about the wait. Oh, and she tosses us a coin. Have a drink on me. We want to thank Lena. Alright, so let's thank Lena. Thank you, we say. We owe you one. She smirks. I get my money's worth out of Slango, don't worry. Wink wonk. Safe. Now we can put letter in in backpack. We want to put the S remover into the backpack. Nice monocle, by the way. You do have all the good toys. Suppose it means you can check your work and see whether you've really got enough paste on things. <laughs> yes. Okay, now let's close our backpack and go to Counterfeit Monkey. This would be a good time to stop for lunch and a little siesta, says Lena, following us to the door. As we go out, she's rolling down the shades and putting up a closed sign. We have a brief hike through the marina district. Slango sits at a dark table, nursing a root beer. Slango is, of course, not Slango's real name. He is half criminal, half ideological revolutionary, uncouth, restless, always hungry for a new exploit. Had he been born into a freer society, he might have become a very valuable engineer or consultant. He's been your mentor in crime and your usher into the world of adults. We can also see a pill here. Slango meets our eye for a long minute without smiling. All right. Slango, you say. Lena gave me a totally unwanted visual about your yak-like proportions. Guess you also got a yak sense of clock time? It was an emergency. I figured you'd go to Lena, and I was right. <laughs> you were lucky. I knew her a little, but I had no idea you were making the yak with two humps. No such thing as a Bactrian yak, Slango replies. My apologies. I assumed that what Brock knows he passes on to you, and he certainly knows about me and Lena. He scowls into his root beer. Nearly gave himself a hernia laughing, Slango adds under his breath. I'd like to explain Brock's the probable reasons, or ask whether we can leave now. Explain Brock's reasons. She's old enough to be your spinster aunt and flaky enough to tell your fortune with half a tarot deck and a couple of Uno cards, you say. We haven't got a lot of clues about what your type is, but I doubt Brock would have guessed Lena. She's 32, says Slango crisply. She runs Radio Free Atlantida single-handedly with electronics she built herself. And... If she were old enough to be my spinster aunt, that would still be my business. So, uh, I guess you guys are pretty serious then, he say. I'd give her and me better odds than you and Brock. We want to mutter darkly or ask whether we can leave now. 
I want to mutter darkly. I grumble under our breath about people who are hung up on their personal issues when there are useful jobs to be done. Slango pretends not to hear. Over the voices of the crowd comes the sound of the barman setting out another round. Brock's run into a little trouble pursuing a profitable opportunity. I'd like to ask what the trouble was. Define trouble. I had a pickup arranged to get him off the island shore all the way down by Miana last night, but he didn't make it and sent no messages. I checked a contact in Bureau Processing, but no arrest file has gone through, so Brock hasn't been caught. He's just missing. Raised voices near the bar interrupt you for a moment. We can't leave without Brock, Slango says, as though you needed persuading. Or maybe he's saying that to the me half of us. Right now, it's true that I'm not keen on the prospect of hanging out in Atlantis. We're already way behind the plan. We could complain about the inefficiency of this scheme. You have a fleeting thought of how it started with Brock. Okay, why don't we start by remembering how it started? It was early morning, almost a year ago now. A dim light came through the portholes. A $4,000 mink blanket covered your hip. You sat up and started fishing around beside the bed in the dove gray shadows for your bra. Brock put a hand on your thigh. It seems you woke him. That wasn't your first time, he said. No, you were still feeling for the underpants and the shirt, not looking at him. Well, you were made of human after all, Brock stretched, grinned. After breakfast, I'll clear you some drawer space. This was a one-night event, you said. You're familiar with the concept? He got very still, then he got out of bed. Without looking at you, he got his trunks out of the drawer. I'm going for a swim. Then we're back in the present. Okay, so I guess we kind of slept our way into the criminal element. Joy of joys. Sorry, but I have to get this out there. I was really expecting a smoother escape plan when I arranged to work with your operation, I say. Slango eyes us with disfavor. Andra... You got a moron up in your head. Kid, Alex, we aren't travel agents. Over the voices of the crowd comes the sound of the barman setting out another round. I've got to get back to the yacht. It's empty, Slango says, and I would prefer not to let the Bureau get a good look at me, while your current face is, shall we say, disposable. The trick is, we don't know where Brock is. If he left a message for us, it'll be at the dead drop. That's the spot at the public convenience by the town bus station, where the three of you leave messages for one another when necessary. Usually quiet, yet anonymous. We're on it, we say. Glad to hear it, says Slango. Now stop referring to yourself as we in company. Ah, oh, come on. I love using the royal we. This gives us something to go on. Anyway, we give Slango what I intend as a reassuring nod of solidarity. Back to the yacht for me, Slango says. Don't let the other half of your head do anything you wouldn't do. Which of us are you talking to? I ask smartly. Both. He heads out toward the docks and quickly disappears from view. Returning to the yacht to wait for us to arrive with Brock. Your score has gone up by five points and is now 37.
יוסף. Inventory. Oh, yeah. Our coin is an as, which is to say a particularly um, historic currency. Look at as. It appears to be an as, a Roman coin of very low denomination. Your knowledge, not mine. Should I ask how you know such things? It is made of copper and has the letters SC stamped on one side. Is a pastis. So let's put monocle back in backpack. May gently remove the monocle and put it back in the backpack. Wave. Er, no. Rub. Use gel on as. We dip out a fingertip coating quantity of gel and rub it gently onto the as. With an audible sport, the as becomes a pastis, an anise-flavored liqueur. It's an acquired taste, but now that I've acquired it, I'd like to ac exercise the acquisition as frequently as possible. You may not be a big fan, for which I apologize in advance. a little of the pastis. Delicious and cooling. Pastis would make a real mess. Close the backpack. Check the dead drop at the public convenience. So let's go to public convenience. We drive through the marina district to the roundabout. I'll be the roundabout. The words will make you out and out. <laughs> the words will make you out and out. Ha ha ha. The whole roundabout has ground to a halt, with protesters walking in the street and, in some places, completely filling the road. But this is mostly a nuisance until I notice that there are a couple of teenagers handcuffed to a tree. I give the wheel a yank and run the car up onto the central traffic circle a little way. Call it a parking job. We need to get those kids out of here before their arrest is processed and they go to storage. 
I might not have the nerve to do anything by myself, but you're with me, and I'm starting to appreciate that's be like being Batman. Normally, no pedestrian ever comes to this circle of grass and litter. The flow of traffic is too constant and too fast. But the protest has stopped the traffic, and I'm determined to do something about the two teenagers I just saw. So here we are, though we probably have to get out of the car if we're going to be useful. Okay, let's do that. Get out of car. I can see an officer making his way between the cars and stopping at the fake ones. Maybe we'd better conceal our car before we leave it. We may need to make a quick getaway later. Okay, so... Use origin paste on the car. Close our backpack again. Now, let's with I remember this part too. This is one of the few parts where you can sop lock yourself if you um don't do this fast enough. Um so let's wave an R remover at the tree. Uh we don't have a good angle. Oh. <sighs> Get out of car. A giant Atlantida statue stands at the center, decorated in an or unorthodox fashion with a sign and a stuffed octopus. Atlantida is to us a bit as Uncle Sam might be to you, except that she embodies the spirit of the people rather than the government. In the recent years, she's become a symbol of opposition to the Bureau. Two teenagers are cuffed to a brown tree, apparently for safekeeping, while the all-purpose officer undoes their vandalism. He has a diminutive affixer. Go ahead, put us in cold storage, shouts the defiant teenager. I'm happy to sleep through all this shit and wake up when we have jetpacks and a government that respects the rights of its people. The all-purpose officer shifts the restoration gel rifle from one hand to another, looks around, and then props it against the foot of the statue. <sighs> right, let's save our remover at tree. The device buzzes puzzled. It has tried to create a brown tea. Evidently, a tree is too tightly bound to its modifiers and can't be manipulated separately. This is a serious problem in my field of study, incidentally. Or perhaps it just doesn't have sufficient power to handle the brown tree. The nervous teenager looks unhappy. We won't get out of here until our families are all dead and global warming has reduced Atlantis to three square feet of hilltop. The all-purpose officer goes around the back of the statue and begins to climb up the leg, finding footholds in the folds of Atlantida's gown. It looks like a precarious business, but he is determined. So we've got a brown tree.
He has a rifle, all purpose gel that is set up against the leg of the statue. I remember that this puzzle exists. I don't remember the solution to it, so we're just going to have to keep going. Um, let's see here. What if we turn the tree into a brow? Tree? Oh, no. Wait, he has a diminutive affixer. Okay, now he's climbing for access out onto Atlantida's huge metal arm. It looks about as sturdy and substantial as a tree branch, but more slippery and inconveniently angled. Maybe we can turn it into a meal arm? One of the other protesters tries to free the teenagers while the all-purpose officer isn't paying attention, but the bonds are too strong. Once the all-purpose officer comes level with the sign, he shoots it with the diminutive affixer, turning it into a signet. It's an outsized signet bearing the crest of the Bureau of Orthography, now hanging around the statue's neck in the same way that the sign did a moment ago.
one of them looks nervous, the other defiant. When she catches us looking her way, she contorts herself uncomfortably in order to be able to give us the finger. Hmm. On the giant Atlanta statue are a signet and a stuffed octopus. What if I just take the rifle? We pick up the rifle. It fits well in your hand. A good heft. I feel like we know how to aim this thing. It's illegal to carry, but that doesn't seem to be bothering you right now. The teenagers look at us rather desperately. Boriously, and with obvious irritation, the all-purpose officer pries the arms of the stuffed octopus off the statue's wrist, where they appear to have been fixed with glue. We shoot the restoration gel rifle at the brown tree. With an audible splort, the brown tree becomes a brown tee. It's a brown wooden peg for putting a golf ball on. Apparently, the all-purpose officer performed a little light R insertion when he found himself in need of a portable tree. Freed from attachment to the tree, the teenagers look at each other and then run off into the crowd. The all-purpose officer glances around, but you've made a stand so our body conceals the rifle from his angle. He growls in annoyance. Station, he says, apparently to thin air. I need backup. Understood, says a dis tinny distant voice. The all-purpose officer tosses the stuffed octopus away. It falls pathetically to earth. And here's where we're gonna save and say goodnight. So, let's just 